How you guys doing? That's, uh, that's what I'm talking about. I love it. As soon as I come on, the world ends. <laughs> when is up with that? So yeah, I'm uh, I'm Alex. Uh, thank you for from fr yeah from vir form <coughs> former Virgin. Um, I'm now the uh, the CEO of a, a new music startup called Rushmore. Uh, we just came out of private beta. Thank you to TechCrunch for stealing our thunder. Um, check it out if you're into music, which everybody universally is. We we just wanted to build something that uh, kind of lets people do everything they love in music. So stay up to date on the music that you're into uh, and all that. But um, I wanted to show you again these slides. That's weird. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to spend the next 43 minutes and 33 seconds uh, sharing some of the examples and ideas and philosophies and personality traits and pitfalls that I've seen people make, that we've made, that I've seen people uh, make in my past life. Before this, I was global head of online for the Virgin Group, uh, running uh, the Virgin Digital Strategy and Richard Branson's Digital Strategy, and we made some monumental fuck-ups, uh, which I won't share with you. <laughs> so the key to all of this is that I want you, what I want you to be able to do, and the thing that Virgin is incredibly good at, is standing out punching above their weight, appearing to be much bigger, or in this instance, much spicier than they actually are. That's a gift. That's an art. And I hope throughout this uh, presentation, you'll, you'll see some of the people that have done that really, really well. But before we dive into this, we'll do a little group exercise. Don't worry. It's not awkward or weird. Not going to have to kiss each other or anything like that. <laughs> Think about this for a second. What brand do you love? What product do you love? What service do you love? Which, what brand do you use every single day that gives you warm, fuzzy feelings every time you use it? What brand could you not live without? Shout them out to me. Give them to me. Google. <laughs> nice. Nice Google employee. <laughs> Apple. Apple. Okay, Apple. We always get Apple. What else? Evernote, nice, moving in the tech space. So I did this once and someone was just like, women! <laughs> oh. Yeah, and that's not really how this works. So mine is Diet Coke. There is nothing better to me in the entire world than a cool, crisp, refreshing can of Diet Coke. Now, they're not paying me. I know it's going to hit the spot wherever I go in the world. I know it's going to taste the same. I am 100% brand loyal to Diet Coke. So much so, right? So much so that if I go into a bar or a restaurant and I order a Diet Coke and the waiter or waitress says, would Diet Pepsi be okay? It's like they've spit on my grandmother. <laughs> no, no, it's not okay. And I'll leave the restaurant and probably come back and burn it down. Now, here's the question though, right? How can I have such an emotional, passionate, evocative response to basically poison in a tin can? Right? If I can have that reaction, that brand affiliation to this, anybody can have that type of reaction to what you're creating, even if you're creating the most boring shit in the entire world. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. The challenge now is you have to work your ass off. The marketplace has never been more crowded. You can s launch your product on Monday, and by Friday, you'll have a competitor. That's the reality of the world that which we're living in. It scares the shit out of a lot of people, and it motivates other people. I strongly encourage you to be one of those people that is motivated by that. Now, all this has happened in our generation. We are the children of the new age, or whatever. The landscape has changed, right? We all know that fundamentally, and it keeps accelerating faster and faster and faster. In the good old, olden days, it used to be super easy to advertise and to do marketing, right? You would, you would put up your billboard or your radio ad or commercial, and you would say whatever the hell you wanted because there were no feedback mechanisms. There was no way to engage with your users. There was no way for them to ask questions. So you said whatever the hell you wanted. And people did. These are all real ads from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. An ounce of prevention is worth pound of, a pound of cure. Basically, if you smoke cigarettes, you'll get better. Wh what would happen if a cigarette company... We don't even let cigarette companies advertise anymore. If they did something like this, we would destroy them. Uh, 
You mean a woman can open it? This isn't a joke. <laughs> this isn't a joke. It's a feature. It's a feature. You imagine Facebook. It's secure, and you can connect to your friends, and women can use it. Mm, buy Facebook. Uh, for my nerds in the room, this is a computer, and then the single greatest strap line in advertising history, you bet your sweet telex operator it is. <laughs> and then this next one I actually, actually have framed in my office because I think it is just a wonderful piece of advertising. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, is that, tr is that true? <laughs> have I been doing it all wrong for these, all these years? Now look. If you don't believe the brands, which more often than not you shouldn't, then you will believe legendary American comedian Bob Hope in one of the creepiest pictures I've ever seen. <laughs> and if Bob says smoke Chesterfield cigarettes, you're going to smoke Chesterfield cigarettes. Now, if for some reason you don't believe Bob Hope, you got some beef with him, you don't think he's funny, then you will believe your doctor. And if your doctor tells little Timmy there to smoke camel cigarettes, Timmy's going to grow up smoking camel cigarettes. That, that, that's how it worked. That was the reality of it. It's hard to end on a somber, um, somber note there, but that's it, right? Now, it doesn't work like that. In fact, now, you can't just build a product or a service and think, okay, that's it, I'm done, we're done, we're done. That's all we have to do. It, it's not good enough. You actually have to spend some time, um, and I'm glad Heather said this in her talk, and you have to be introspective. You actually have to shift your way of thinking. You have to sh shift the way you do things. You have to shift the way you actually perceive yourself and the industry in which you're operating. And the first, absolute number one golden rule, if you want to be any good at this entrepreneur stuff, is you have to be a decent human being. I'm not, don't, I'm not getting all preachy, don't, don't worry. They're not going to make you close your eyes and visualize it. You have to be a good human being. You have to be positive. It is super easy to be a dick. <laughs> it is so, so easy. We are all, our default mode is, is negativity. Why? Because it's the laziest of emotions. It is so much easier to reject someone's position than having to defend your own. So we resort to dicketry, to dickitude whatever you want to call it. And this is a problem not just within the entrepreneurial set, but within Western society, actually, frankly, global society as a whole. We love to tune in in the million, literally in the millions across the planet and watch these reality shows where people stand up on stage and exploit the only tangible talent they think they have while they inevitably fall over their own tongues. We love that shit. We don't love, the f we don't love the successes. We love the failures. We love watching them just suck because we're just a bunch of dicks, and that's awful. I am encouraging you, I'm begging you to reject that mentality. It is far easier to build positive product and positive entrepreneurial environments if you just reject that. Fundamentally, ideas, creativity, passion, Emotional investment, all of which are necessi ne necessary to build good product, thrive in positive environments. Now, I am fortunate enough to be uh, both American and British and split my time between London and the Silicon Valley. Um, and there's one clear advantage that I think the Silicon Valley has over just about anywhere, but it, the, the, the opposites are most glaring having spent a time in, in London as well and having British... Uh, ancestry, is the appreciation and respect of the purity of an idea. Do, do anyone, any of you know who Stephen Fry is? He's a British uh, actor. He narrated the Harry Potter audiobooks. He's basically a national treasure in the UK. And uh, he did a TV show a couple of years ago where he drove a, a London taxi around the US uh, and basically pointed out how stupid we are. But he ended up in the Silicon Valley talking to Johnny Ive. Um, and because uh, Stephen Fry is a huge Apple advocate. And he put the, he's put this comment to, to, to St uh, Johnny Ive. He said, arguably two of the most influential British people in the last 20 years, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, creator of the web, and Johnny, Sir Johnny Ive, uh, the Apple design god, have chosen to live and work in the United States. Not just the United States, but the Bay Area. Why is that? 
And Johnny Ive pointed immediately, without hesitation, to the respect for ideas. And he said this, I think that a sense of inquisitiveness and the willingness to try is so important for design, for developing those tentative, fragile ideas into a real product. I think that's a beautiful way of capturing that sentiment. Now, let me give you a practical example, and these are generalizations. I love my British kinfolk. But here's what happens. And I'm an angel investor in London. I see this all the time, too much. If someone will come up to another investor or just some random bloke on the street and go, Here, here's my idea. What do you think of it? And you're like, oh, this is your idea? Let's see if it can fly. <laughs> no, it's shit. And so are you. That's the reality of it. We are a very cynical people, of the British, and it takes a lot more. So there's this, this lack of ideas. They die on the whiteboard, and that's the most depressing thing I can think of. Passionate entrepreneurs who've got a great idea that can never see the light of day because some uh, angel investor or VC uh, had a shitty morning or hates their wife or whatever. In the Valley, and again, an exception to the rule, is they take an idea and they go, let's see if it can fly. If it does, we laud its success, unless it's Groupon. If it fails, we pick it up, we dust it off, we pivot, we move on. Or we go, we learned a lot when we kill it. Virgin was very good at that, understanding business lessons from failed businesses. So that is super, super important. And it, so there's this massive difference, I think, between that respect of ideas, and then the confidence you have, the assertiveness you have, you need to be able to execute on those ideas and convince others that this is a product that's going to do well, to come along for the ride. You have to be confident, you have to be assertive, you have to kick ass, and you have to take names. You can be a dick internally. It cannot manifest itself in you standing on stage at TechCrunch Disrupt, dropping your pants and going, kiss my ass because I'm better than you. That's not how you do this. But you have to be assertive. You have to be confident in what you're creating. And it has to show in your product. And that can be most exposed when you're dealing with your competition. It's very, very easy when you're dealing with your competition or people you view as competitors or anybody who has ever kind of stood in your way to just let out your inner dick, your metaphorical dick, not your real dick. I don't want to have to bail you out of jail. And I love this. Sevi Ballesteros, Alex can probably pronounce that way better than I did. He's a legendary uh, Spanish golfer, one of the best who ever, who ever played the game. And I love this quote. He sadly died a few years ago. He said, when asked about his competition, I look into their eyes, shake their hand, pat their back, and wish them luck. But I'm thinking, I'm going to bury you. And that is it right there in a nutshell. What you have to be thinking is out Outward respect of the competitor, outward respect of the game, but a healthy confidence in what you are doing. Now, my favorite topic of all time. <laughs> I'm going to get a little ranty. I, and I, no, but I am getting on an airplane tomorrow, so probably not a wise. So at the, like where I am in this picture, there's a guy just sitting there like this, and you know that he just has to go and update his resume. <laughs> so there is the cult of failure. You have all been exposed to it. I've heard it, I've been in, in, in Krakow for about six hours and I've heard it come up way too many times. The sexification of failure, the cult of failure. Failure is stupid. Stop, 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 stop. This idea has gone way too far. Cover of Wired Magazine and UK Wired Magazine a couple of years ago. An outstanding publication uh, around the world. Fail in big letters. And then they try and get their asses out of it by putting an asterisk and saying, fast and then succeed. If you have a copy of this, please burn it. Because it's just not OK to think like this. And I figured it out. I figured it out why this uh, has become such a force in the entrepreneur and business world. Um, because the people that are propagating it are, are failures, and they don't know how to deal with it. The people that say you should fail often are failures. <laughs> and they're just not coping with it. So they, 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 they have this, this weird notion that, it, that it's now becoming a prerequisite. You have to fail before you succeed. 
Your last business, $40 million raised, six users. No, dude, it's cool, it's cool. We're, our next business will be fine because we've had our failure. You see, you have to do it. What the fuck are you talking about? It doesn't work like that. And the hilarious part of it is technology has made this whole thing way worse. Way worse. I love this quote. Can you, computers have enabled people to make mistakes faster than any invention in human history except tequila and handguns. <laughs> now, to those that use failure as a coping mechanism, it is not a coping mechanism. That's what we're all going to be doing in about 28 minutes. Failure is not a coping mechanism. Now, the worst part about this, my, my kind of comedy bit is over. <laughs> the worst part about this is this. The original idea that intelligent, smart people were putting out is a pure one, is a good one. Learn from your mistakes. I'm, I'm more of a proponent um, of the rework model, which is learn from your successes. Learning from your failures is the, the average value. Learning your, from your successes makes a lot more sense. But learn from your mistakes has been bastardizing to you have to fail before you succeed. You have to fail before you succeed. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you think the guys that invented this thought they had to fail before they succeeded? <laughs> Do you think that they would have done it? <laughs> no. So, this notion, this philosophy, this bastardiz bastardization of a great idea um, has meant that people are now inadvertently afraid of taking risk, which is a good thing. It's this exhaust of the sexification of failure that has ruined it for a lot of us. There's a guy talking on the street, taking a risk. I'm sure he's taking a risk. Joe Stump, I'm sure many of you know who Joe Stump is, lead, first lead architect at Dig, um, started Simple Geo, and now runs a great company called Sprintly. Uh, I love this. He said this to me. Uh, we were quite drunk at the time, um, and I've never forgotten it. Failure is a tool not an expletive merit badge is actually the direct quote. Um, and it's absolutely true. It is a tool. It's a way of learning. It's a way of iterating. It's a way of moving on. It's a way of, it's a piece of data that we can use to evolve the rest of our product. All right, failure. Screw it. So I, again, like I said, I live in England. And up until very recently, I lived in rural England, middle of frigging nowhere. But before I get into that, I want to tell you something. I was in Las Vegas three years ago for a conference. Uh, I was staying on the 42nd floor of a 56-story uh, uh, hotel. I was in Las Vegas 18 months before that, and that hotel did not exist. <laughs> Holy shit, how is that even possible? They beat a 56-story hotel in 18 months. That's just how they roll, right? Now, in my tiny little village, uh, in, in England, we have a road that's probably as wide as this little pathway to the bar. Every, and like maybe four and a half cars a year go on it. When, one time they, they dug a hole for whatever reason and they were bored. When they, instead of doing their stuff and sp putting steel plates over it like they do in most civilized countries and life goes on, they put one of those temporary lights here and one here and the entire village came to a stop because they were talking all the time. They were talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. And that has become a super bad habit of startups. Blogging, tweeting, constantly, podcasting, networking at conferences. Shh. Always at, always at events. I mean, it's good to come to the good, good conferences, but not every friggin' conference all the time. And then a year goes by, and nobody has seen a line of code, and suddenly you are obsolete, and you haven't even launched yet because you've spent all your time talking. And remember, this is coming from a marketing douchebag and somebody who, who learned from the biggest marketing douchebag of all time that built one of the biggest brands of all time talking. But behind the scenes, there were very, very smart people doing. So talk less or at least refine the conversations and the outgoing messages to be a lot more strategic and build. You will be judged, for better or worse, not on what you say, but what you create. Unless you're a speaker, Unless you're a speaker and you can say whatever you want. <laughs> But it's true. If you're building product and you say our product's going to do A, B, C, D, E, and F, and you 
producer product that does A and B, what are you going to be judged on? A and B and failure to deliver the rest, right? Build. So <laughs> it's Latin, so I had to put it in a classy font. Esse <laughs> quam videre. It essentially means to do without being seen to do or do to appear without appearing to be. It's the motto of a, a Dakota or a Carolina, but it's also the motto of a gigantic multi-billion dollar global conglomerate, n which none of you have ever heard of. But the brands that they've created and the business models and procedures and processes and manufacturing that they've created, you've all heard of and you've used every single day. Well, I will, I will get that tattooed on my ass because that is something that I think we can all live by. Do, but don't necessarily need to be seen doing it. Create, build. Community is one of those wonderful words that um, doesn't get the credit it deserves. We kind of, uh, well, we don't give it the love it deserves. We, every single pr one of you, if you're building a product or work for a company, have an internal and external community. And they are the, that is the most powerful asset that any organization or company can ever have. And the key to growth, efficient growth, cheap, maybe even free growth, is by embracing your community. I want to give you a, a couple of examples. Um, there is a, you all know what a burrito is? I'll explain. <laughs> It's all right, you know what? I've done this in China. And they're like, what the fuck is a burrito? So we went for burritos after the talk. Uh, th there was a little chain, and for those of you that live in London, this might be familiar. Um, little tiny, this is two 2007. An ex-Skyper uh, uh, wanted to get out of the tech game, and he's Californian, and wanted to start a burrito restaurant. Now, he happened to open a restaurant at basically the worst time in human history to ever open a restaurant. Down economy, uh, the fast food retail was just through the floor, so it really hurt him. So he was like, I need to generate buzz, I don't have any money. <clears throat> so he held the UK's first burrito eating competition. 10 pounds to enter, all the money going to a local uh, children's charity and you got a burrito, and it was basically how fast, not how many, how fast could you eat a burrito? And uh, so to kind of walk you through how it worked, I want to show you a couple of pictures. This guy was a, was a food blogger for the Daily Telegraph, a respected broadsheet newspaper in the UK. And uh, he, he, was in, he was in it to win it, so he was prepped. Um, there's a burrito, it's, so it's, like a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a wrap filled with you know, rice and cheese and meat and vegetables, about the size of a baby. And, Again, how quickly you should eat it. And so he's, he's going hard and really going hard. And then it all starts to go a little wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, no. Oh, and he's okay. Uh, he did not win. Uh, my brother won. My brother is the UK burrito eating champion. <coughs> We're all very proud of him. <laughs> So that was picked up by every major newspaper in the UK. They now have, they now have six uh, stores, and they saw off competition from a very large, well, Chipotle. Chipotle came to the UK and are failing dismally. So good. Independent business, David Goliath story, simple. Uh, what did it cost them? 100 burritos, and now they're doing great. What a simple, great investment to make. Um, at Rushmore, uh, we have a <coughs> contribution mechanism, so people contribute to the, mu to the gaps in the music eco ecosystem, and we want to say thanks for that. And so we've got a, uh, we call it a league table or a chart of our best users. If a new user, uh, so anytime anyone breaks the, the top 300, I handwrite them a letter with some stickers saying, hey, thanks for getting involved, man. We really, really appreciate it. And people go nuts. They're like, oh my god, I got a handwritten letter in the mail that's not a ransom note. This is, what, <laughs> it's, it's 2013, what's happening? And so Twitter and Instagram and Facebook just light up with these things because we're creating very powerful moments of delight. Tangible, holdable, physical moments of delight in a purely digital business. Um, and you know, it's little things, like this guy said, I knew Rushmore was cool when they offered to send stickers, but they sent them airmail all the way from the UK. It's like, it didn't really cost us much, dude, but that is now a Rushmore user for life. Because we just took a, a second. I know it's not scalable. Don't look at me like that. I get it. But we can, if we have 300 million users, and I, I write 
a few of them a week, those people are going to be delighted, and that's fine. These things don't have to scale. It's just finding the time to do it. It's frightening to me how often this gets overlooked. We have all this amazing technology, a lot of which you guys are, are building, but we, f we tend to forget that we've had the technology to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with our users for nearly 10 years now, yet nobody does it with any sense of not creepiness. It's really quite extraordinary how you can bridge the gap between online and offline. Online companies bitch all the time. Oh, I don't have a way to meet my users. Piss off. Yes, you do. They're standing right in front of you. You have the data. Organize meetups. Go hang out with them. Just tweet. Hey, the guys, if you're at a big, big company, hey, the guys that built this pr part of the product that you love are going to be hanging out at this bar. Come have a beer with us. I guarantee you people will show up. And those people are your god. You buy them whatever they want because the feedback that you're going to get from them and the enthusiasm and passion that you're going to get from them will make everything seem worthwhile. And, the v and it will blow your R&D out of the water. So spend some time with them. It's hugely, hugely important. And it's little things. And it can be so stupid and analog. There's a hotel in New York that I first went to, man, when I was at Virgin, so like seven years ago. Not a virgin, was at virgin. <laughs> Don't, that's not even funny. <laughs> Seven, he's 33. Oh, my God. Anyway, you know when you get to a hotel, you fill out all the crap, you know, where do you live and passport number. At the bottom, they had, what are your favorite snacks? I'm like, oh, that's kind of gimmicky. Diet Coke, the uh, cook, <coughs> excuse me, this particular, particular type of cookie, and chi chips. By the time I got to my hotel room, there was a, a letter and a basket and a fridge full of Diet Coke. <laughs> I am never, ever, ever going to another hotel again. And, uh, and I will pay above. And of course, every time I go back, they don't even have to ask. Still there. And the letter says uh, at the bottom, are you still down with this? Um, if you want to try anything else, just let us know. We'll, we'll get it from wherever we get it. Cost, wholesale, nothing. But I love them. I will pay over market value to stay with these guys, even if the Intercontinental has you know, super cheap. And this isn't even a that nice a hotel. Another travel-related story. So I'm a gold card holder on Virgin. Not, I just travel a lot. No special things. <laughs> um, a gold card is given to someone who travels far too much, which is me. Uh, I've had one for the last five years. And I usually travel down the back in the cheap seats and not in the pointy end. So I don't get the experience that uh, a lot of uh, kind of first class and business class passengers get. However, and this is so something the Virgin does so right, irrespective of where I am in the airplane, the in-flight service manager or cabin manager or, or whatever you, your airline refers to their s the most senior flight attendant as, comes and finds me, hands me a glass of champagne, and says, it's good to see you b uh, back again, Alex. Alex! They call me Alex because one time they called me Mr. Hunter, and I said, that's creepy. Call me Alex. And they remember every single time, different flights, different destinations. I don't even like that, like champagne. But I'm going to drink that shit because I know where it came from. I know the process and the metrics and the dedication it took to remember that. So let's be honest. How many of you all flown on Virgin Atlantic? So a few of you. It's no Emirates or Singapore Airlines. Or cafe. I mean, those guys, it's like not even a thing, right? But I will continue to fly on them because they get the little human touches right. And that's what the entire Virgin brand is built on. If you cannot compete on product, compete on human. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. On the pure tech side of things, and I flew over on these guys today, and, you know, again, mediocre physical product, but they use their data about their users intelligently. They use Advertising real estate sensibly based on uh, assuming where a user is coming from in the world. Uh, so I'm on a UK IP, so everything is UK centric. They can predict with the closest uh, uh, departure points and show me that. At the at the very least, that's that's what we could do. If they're showing me departures from from Italy to somewhere in Spain, the chances of me converting on that data, yoink, microscopic. As I use the product more, it understands my preferences more. Their CRM and retention uh, methodologies are world class for a low-cost airline. And what we get out of that 
Can you tell I'm an aviation nerd? There's a lot of... <laughs> this is a day's worth of uh, air traffic in Western Europe. Uh, we get patterns emerging. Now, the, the reason why I use air for traffic control is not because I'm a weapons-grade plane nerd, which I am, but think about how air traffic control works for a second. Every single one of those dots, and it gets crazier in a second to the point where my computer can't handle it, every single one of those dots has a request and need in real time that is assessed and granted and passed on to the next fulfiller in real time. There's no predictability. Okay, there's, there's planned routes, but in aviation, there's no predictability. And that's what we can do. We can take individual requests from our users, process them in real time, and hand them on to the next person who can continue that great customer journey, pun intended. So use what you know about your users to create those individual experiences. And I know this is business. I run a business. Y'all run businesses. The benefits here are numerable. You get increased conversion because you're showing relevant data. You get repeat business because you're creating customer delight. And you're creating ancillary revenue opportunities because you're going back to them with good converting data at points where they might not have already been considering product. All right, next one. Don't suck. For the longest time in technology, in the 90s, basically since the dawn of technology, all you had to do to, to get to beat your competitor was to suck slightly less than they did. Like, I'm talking about the big boys, you know, like, oh, theirs does this, this cra theirs crashes 65 times a day, ours crashes 58 times a day, so we're better. Don't even think for a second that you can get away with that in this day and age. Because the user base is vocal and as connected as we are, we won't let you get away with it. And besides, is mediocrity something that we really want to be striving for as entrepreneurs? Absolutely not. There is only one industry in the entire world that has managed to get away with mediocrity for decades. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. I think this is a really important quote. Arthur C. Clarke, this, the science, British science fiction author, said this. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indis indistinguishable from magic. You have to create the sense of magic. You have to create the sense of wow. Whenever I open your product or use your service or do whatever, and it does not have to be a sexy industry, I have to go, oh my god. This is amazing. It could be a feature update. It could be an animation. It could be a UX component. It could be an idea. You have to create that sense of magic. Because magic, as and to create enduring loyalty, you need emotional investment. For emotional investment, you need to create emotion. A sense of wow. Is a, anyone know what that is? Yeah, I, read the, so I, get, I did this, um, showed this example at an um, insurance broker's event, and they're like, nope, no idea. Now, we all know that's a Nest learning thermostat. So. People always say, none of this applies to me. I work in maritime insurance or some other boring as hell industry. Thermostats are not interesting. At least they weren't. They were beige boxes that sat on your wall and occasionally caught you on the shoulder when you walked past them. They were a nuisance. No one knew how to use them. Our bills were always too high and our house was always too cold. There was an opportunity here, but they didn't just suck slightly less. They revolutionized. They created wow. People walk past these things and go, holy shit, what is that? I want to touch it. Which is exactly the, the, the philosophy behind a lot of Apple product, which this was <laughs> born out of the brain of, a per of an Apple person. This is basically don't ignore the long tail. Remember that no matter how shiny the newest iteration of your product is, not everybody's clicked app update. Are the, is the person that uses your product for the very first time, opens the box, touches it, going to get that same sense of wow that you got when you first powered it up or you first uh, submitted your app to the app store or when your mom loved it? And that's important. That type of feedback and emotional bond is incredibly important. Are your long tail users going to have the same thing? I learned this in an intro. I was taught this. Um, before I joined the Virgin Mothership in London, I was one of the very first employees at Virgin America. Anyone flown on Virgin America? Nice. So I joined when there was no airplanes, no license to fly, the... the we were all around one table. 
trying to create something great. Now, uh, the if you've flown on the U.S. domestic uh, carrier, that you know it's like slamming your fingers in a car door over and over again, right? It's awful. It's awful, 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 awful experience. So you could argue that we could suck slightly less and with minimal capital, well, okay, not minimal, but with capital expenditure, we could improve that with this. That's the inside of a Virgin America airplane, mood lighting, IFE, was all touch screen, you order your food on the plane, Wi-Fi, blah, 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 music in the toilets, totally revolutionary for the US domestic market. But we, developing the broad product, had to think of the, of it, of the airplane like this, empty. Featureless, except for the pretty pink lights. Why? Because that is the last part of the product life cycle. That is the last thing a user does. It's not the first thing. It's easy to think that's the product. But a user's got to go through so many hoops before they get to experience the complete and total awesomeness of Virgin America. They have to go online and book the tickets. They have to find the seats. They have to pay. They have to go to the airport and check in. They have to board, and then they have to find their seat. If any one of those, not all, but if one of those things was below standard or upset them, this could be even greater than it was. Not possible, but if it was, they'd still be pissed off. So we had to take a completely holistic view at how we uh, wanted to do this. And I'll explain how we did it. We wanted... We had a mission, and the mission was to create an airline people love. Why? Because it was de deemed sufficiently impossible for us to meet. You want to create an airline people love? Yeah, that's just not possible. Okay, cool. That's exactly what we're going to try and do. Out of that came core values, as one does. Standard branding exercise. The next thing we did that hardly anybody does is this. We identified every point at which a user could interact with this. Obviously, a very small subsection you're seeing here. And we made damn sure that every single one of those values reflected our mission, what we were trying to achieve. So everything, you know, articles, web design, virgin, the businesses that we associated ourselves with, our uh, seats, the music in the toilets, the fact that we called passengers guests and not passengers is a big psychological, psychological switch there. Check-in agents were not behind a desk or a podium. They were out in front in tables, which we manufactured, they were furniture, big psychological difference. So that if your first exposure to Virgin America was some retweet that you saw, you would get, uh, you would get an understanding of what we were trying to achieve. Now, the interesting thing here is we well, can control stationary and advertising and messaging and all that stuff. A lot of, all the things that are circled there, those are people. People are inherently difficult to, to coordinate and to keep on message. We all know that. So every single person that joined Virgin America, irrespective of rank, seniority, no matter what, went through a full day brand immersion exercise, which we called the brand bath. It was quite emotionally draining. We all kind of went through it to understand the genesis of the Virgin brand, Virgin America, the brands that we love, why do we love them, how do we generate that emotional response, so that we could reflect everything that I talked about in that. I'm going to zip through this quickly, um, the Virgin America story, because it is a great example of PR hacking. Um, so Virgin America is my pride and joy. It's the greatest product I've ever worked on besides Rushmore. And uh, I am incredibly grateful to have been a part of it. Um, yes, we did call our first airplane Jefferson Airplane. Um, we worked our asses off constantly. 18, 19, 20 hours a day for months and months and months because we knew our mission was pure. We wanted to change the way Americans flew. And meanwhile, the financing was going on and the, the legal stuff was going on and we were ready and we were ready and we had planes arriving. <coughs> and then the Department of Transportation ruled that Virgin America was owned by a foreigner, which is incredibly illegal in America, um, and that Richard Branson was a foreigner and therefore the airline could never fly. Stamp denied, and this was this was the single worst day of my life. The the thing that we'd all been working for for forever, and we knew was going to change the world, and knew that people were going to love it. They said, "No, you you can't fly." And so, this was on the 28th of uh, actually happened on the 27th. Uh, I went to Phoenix for several days and crawled into a bottle, as many of my colleagues did, because that was it. We had to brush up our resumes. The dream was over. We were done. 
Fortunately, I got off the airplane and a few other people got off their airplanes from their respective drinking holes. And we thought, no, 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 no. Fuck this noise. We've worked too hard. The American public deserve better. This is an awesome product. So the uh, legal people and the financial people went and did their things. And those were the ones that really were more important. And we're like, okay, fine. To that day, we'd never shown the inside of the airplane. Ever, 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 ever. Because we didn't want the competition to see it because we didn't know how long the process was going to take. So we didn't want them to have a head start. So we threw up a campaign site in about 18 hours and showed the product. Here's what, here's what it is. I asked for a little bit of budget and was laughed at because we had planes sitting on the ground. Planes are reason. I don't know how many of you have an Airbus. How many? Yeah. They're pretty expensive. So our, like, we designed it ourselves, we built it ourselves, we, we partnered with a few people to build apps where you put in your first name and your zip code and it would send a form letter to your congressman, senator, the White House and the Department of Transportation. That was very effective, that was used 75,000 times. We, found, we went through every archive that we had. I found an, uh, a two and a half minute silent video of a, one of our airplanes being painted. And I put it up on YouTube on a Friday night, going, oh, pff, whatever, there, it's something, go. It's a YouTube impression. Uh, and on Sunday night, it had a quarter of a million views. It was literally paint drying. And people were like, oh my god, I had no idea how that's wor that worked. And of course, everybody and their grandmother has copied that now. We took my flip cam, and we filmed our, CE our then CEO walking around the airplane saying, look how pimp our seats are, and this, this. And then at the end saying, come and help us out. Um, we reversed PR because at that point CNBC fortune though the big guys w wouldn't really respond so we started going creating our own content and then talking to the people that made the most sense so instead of going to time and NBC and aerospace magazine and all those guys we went to Engadget and Boing Boing and Jaunted and Gizmodo and people like that and th because these were the influencers these were the people that were looking that the that time and CNN were looking for for stuff like this so for the uh, uh, Wi-Fi the, the whole plane has a server module, like literally server racks in the bottom of the airplane and Wi-Fi. And Gadget loved that. Boing Boing loved the political fight angle. John did love the travel angle. Gizmodo loved that our the in-flight uh, IFE played Doom. <coughs> Great angles, and that's what's important to their readers. So we broke it down into those chunks and, and sold it on that. Um, Dig anyone used to watch Dignation? Yeah. Kevin Rose's show? Um, so Kevin, this is how I first became friends with Kevin. We, uh, we said, hey, guys, um, we didn't know him. We like called him up saying, have you ever done Dignation on an airplane? They're like, no. So they came down and uh, they shot a Dignation on the airplane. And so usually uh, advertising in Dignation is a, is a pre-roll and a mention by, dig by the guys. And so this is basically a 45-minute ad for Let VA Fly, which was our campaign. And the guys were genuinely enthusiastic and have become uh, good friends as a result of this. It was a fun thing to do. Um, and the Department of Transportation had never overturned what was called a negative show cause, ever, 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 ever. And the legal guys and the financing guys did their wonderful things. We got the public behind us, and the ruling was overturned, and Virgin America took off on the 8th of August, 2007, the greatest day of my career. So there you go, how to hack the press if you start an airline. <laughs> All right, quick, quick, now, ah, there were a lot of people involved in that. <coughs> Okay, actually, we, we don't have much time to All ask right, I've got a one more question. slide. Ah, uh, you've got I've one got more? one more slide, and it's, okay. it's this. <laughs> it's, it's this. It's that one. It's, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Go and build something and work hard, and you'll change the world. I promise you. Thank you.